So let's go to John chapter 3, and I'm going to read it from my Bible. I do also want to say that my wife's plane, she's back from Virginia. She took a week off, and um, she uh, flew in last night. The plane was supposed to be here at 1130 from New York City, and she got here about 2.45 a.m. And so we sit in the cell phone lot for a couple of hours and thought, my Lord, am I going to have time to sleep before I teach? And, and so anyway, God has made a way, and thankfully it's something that I'm fairly familiar with, and that's water baptism. Otherwise, I might be up here doing Lord knows what. And so um, we're going to read John 3, start with, chapter, start with verse 1. And if you would please stand for the reading of God's Word as we get into this. Today's subject is water baptism, and the title is Born of Water, and we're going to see where that comes from. It comes from John chapter 3. There's a conversation between Nicodemus, who's a Pharisee, and Jesus Christ, and we're going to see what they say. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So we see in that verse that a man has to be born again. So now we've got to decide what makes a person, male or female, born again. And then Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And now the focus verse is 5, which says, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Unless a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And I'd like to also read verse 6. It says it this way. It says, That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is is spirit. Brother Michael, would you honor me and pray for the message today? Lord, it's such a blessing to be here, Lord. Uh, God, we pray a special anointing for Brother Walker, Lord, that he'll get a special. God, we uh, ask you to do whatever you want to do here, Lord. We come with our hearts, God, that they receive you, Lord, and thank you for what you're doing there. Lord, we pray that you bless Brother Michael, Lord, that he'll have a special anointing for Brother Walker, Lord, that he'll get a special. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Michael. If you all would please be seated. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here today. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Mike. If you all would please be seated. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here today. It's my heart to teach you and to encourage you that. God's word is true and that it is for you. And I like to say that often. God's word is true and it is for you. And just understand that when you read the word of God, you've got to decide what you believe. And frankly, many times it just comes down to that. I tell my students at school, I said, uh, well, I was always told by my mama, my grandmother, that you just do it because I told you to. And sometimes you just told, you know, well, I don't understand it. Well, you just do it because I said so. And so they don't like to hear that. I didn't like to hear that. Most of us don't like to hear that. But the Bible has pretty clear commands when it comes to water baptism, how you're saved, New Testament salvation. And frankly, uh, just do it because God says so. I heard a preacher one time say that I'm a preacher. I'm a persuader. I'm in sales. God's in management. And so if you've got a problem with the policy, take it up with management. I'm just here to sell you what God's given me to sell. And that is that there is a way to be saved. And it is very clear. It's very biblical. And it's specifically expressed in the book of Acts, and we'll look at that uh, together. Acts chapter 2 and 38, Brother Michael, if you, or excuse me, Brother Joseph, if you'd be so kind. 2 and 38 reads this way. Now, this is the uh, Pentecostal verse. Now, I went to a conference one time, and I was listening to one of these big-name preachers. Now, this has been many years ago, but uh, I was sitting next to a gentleman and he said, you know, there's a lot more verses in that Bible besides Acts 2.38. And so he had decided that for whatever reason that Pentecostals relied a little bit too heavily on Acts 2.38. And he talked about John 3 and 16 and other places. And so I just said, well, in my opinion now, I was early in my ministry. I was young in my faith. I couldn't tell him half of what I could tell him today. But frankly, I said, well, if the church is born on the book of, or the day of Pentecost, which is mentioned in the book of Acts on chapter 2, and they, he has asked directly, what must you do to be saved? And he answers very directly in verse 38 that he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so that's the most direct answer to the question in the New Testament, what must we do to be saved? And now we may think that that's work, or we may disagree with that, or we may think God's being unfair. But at the end of the day, that is what God has commanded us to do. And so we may not understand it, especially when we are immature in our faith, when we first come to the knowledge of 
baptism, water baptism, Holy Ghost baptism, we most of the time don't understand the spiritual uh, ramifications of the action. Now, when you get a bit more mature in your faith, you can see how water baptism flows from the Old Testament sign of circumcision, and it comes from the idea of identifying yourself with the death and the burial of Jesus Christ. And so you can see it when you become more mature, when you study your Bible a little bit further, that the reason God does it is clearly laid out in Scripture. That's the reason why he asks us to be water baptized as a part of our salvation experience. However, when we first come to faith, all we know is the Bible says so. And so we come to an altar and we ask God to forgive us of our sins. And now I know my own testimony, and many of you probably feel the same, is that quite often when I pray, I'll ask God to forgive me. God, I'm sorry. God, I made a mistake. God, I, I, I messed up. And when you get a bit more mature in that, you realize that now you messed up and it's brought a reproach to the name of God. So it becomes hurtful. It's no longer I'm afraid of God. Now I have hurt God. And so now I have an intimacy with God, just like I have with my natural father or my natural mother. At some point when you become mature, you realize that I don't want to do certain things, not because I'm afraid of mom or dad. I don't want to do certain things because I don't want to disrespect my mom and dad, and I love them. And so the Bible talks about your relationship with God being similar. So you do certain things in the very beginning as you're first intro or introduced to God, and you do it because you're told so. Because the Bible knows what's best for you, just like when my parents, my natural parents, they know what's best for me. Now, I may not always agree, or I may not always understand, and many times they don't tell me why. They just tell me, you do it because we said so, and we are the elder, we're older, or we have authority over you, or I'm going to get a belt, or whatever it is. Right. And God's belt hurts a lot worse than man's belt, and I just want to tell you that. Amen. And so at the end of it all, eventually, as you mature and you grow, you realize that mom and dad knew what was best for me, even when I didn't understand it. And thank God for mom or dad raising me the way that they raised me because they protected me from so many things that I didn't know that I could have gotten myself involved in. That's God. That's you as a Christian. The Bible protects you. It protects you from things that you didn't even know you needed protection from. It gives you commandments not because God is saying, do this and I will hurt you. God is saying, don't do this. You were not designed to do this. If you do that, you are going to destroy your life. You're going to destroy the lives of your family. And you are going to live a life that you can avoid if you will just listen to what I say. And so we live in a world today where even preachers and churches, no, nobody wants to commit to anybody. Nobody wants to commit to anything. And so frankly, you have to first get people to realize there is a God and they're not God. And then when they acknowledge that there is a God, now they have to make a commitment. So if you believe there is a God, you have to discover who that God is. And when you make that discovery, you have to commit your life and be obedient to what he says. And people don't want to do that. People don't want to commit to each other. They don't want to commit to their spouses, their parents. They don't even want to commit to their own children today. And so we have a hard job ahead of us, and that is to show them that the Bible requires a commitment. The Bible requires that you obey the commands of the Scripture. Even if you don't understand them, even if you're not a theologian or a Bible scholar, it says do it because God says do it. And once you go through that experience and you become mature, and you start praying and reading your word and attending teaching and, and services and church and teaching sessions and so forth, then God's going to show you why you have to do the things you have to do. But until all that makes sense, if the Bible says do it, do it. And if the Bible says don't do it, don't do it. And now you got preachers on every corner that will tell you the Bible says this, the Bible says that. Don't put your salvation and your eternity for you and your family in the hands of some preacher. And that includes me too. You go home and do as the Bereans did when Paul would preach to them. The scripture said they would go back home and they would search the scriptures to verify that what this apostle was teaching them was correct. And he commended them. 
He didn't say, well, you didn't trust me. You've offended me. He actually commended them and said, thankfully, you have gone and proven it to yourself. Because when God reveals something to you, no man can take that away from you. But if you're just doing something because you've been told to do it by some preacher or some church, then you will have that, you know, maybe some other preacher will come along or some other friend will come along and they'll be a little more slick, a little more persuasive. They, you may like their church a little more. Their music program might be a little better or, or, you know, the preacher might be a better preacher than me or others. And so if you don't ground yourself in the Word of God, right. then you will be finding yourself wavering, right. going from here, there, and everywhere else. You can't live off of my faith or someone else's faith. You've got to get to a place in your relationship with God where you take that Bible and you open it up. Maybe it's on a nightstand. Maybe it's on your dining room table. Maybe it's on your couch. And you open the Word of God and you say, Now, I know what they're teaching me. I know what I've heard that comes in conflict with this other teacher or whatever. God, show it to me. And the Bible says that through the power of the Holy Ghost, when you're prayerful, he will light, he will provide the light to the scripture that you need. And so it is your personal responsibility to make sure that what God is teaching in the word of God is something you've discovered for yourself. Now, teachers and preachers and ministers, they're there to guide you, to help you along the way as you journey with your relationship with God. But I will tell you that until you get a personal revelation, until God speaks to you personally, until God shows you personally through the Scripture, until God plants it inside your spirit, you will not buy in the way that we ask you to buy in. You'll hear it. I can persuade you. I could probably show you 85 scriptures that have to do with water baptism types or symbols. I'm not going to do that today. I don't have time. And so if you don't feel like I've made a good case from the scripture when we finish today's lesson that water baptism is required, it's not optional, it's required according to the scripture, then please come to me personally and I would be happy to teach you a home Bible study. I'll be happy to sit across the table and I can break out many, many other scriptures and proof texts to show you that Jesus Christ, who himself was baptized in water for our example, tells us in his word that you ought to likewise be water baptized as an expression of your faith. You go through the death, the burial, and the resurrection experience, when you repent, you have decided, I am no longer going to live the way that I've been living. It's not, I'm sorry. It's not, God, forgive me. It goes beyond that. It's a heart that is dedicated to not do those activities again. Because as I mentioned before, it's easy sometimes for us to say, God, I'm sorry, or God, forgive me. And we know that God will forgive us. But if we don't have a sincere heart, a heart that is broken because we have offended the Almighty God, because we love Him intimately and we're mature enough in our faith to realize that He made a great sacrifice for us, and so He's asking us to do what He's asked us to do. And so when you offend God, does it break your heart? And if it breaks your heart, God sees your sincerity. In Psalm 51, the beautiful prayer of repentance of David, he says, a broken heart, a contrite spirit, you won't despise. God knows what you're made of. He knows we're just dust. We're flesh. He knows that we have limitations and failures. The Bible says you're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. But when it breaks your heart because you have offended God, then you're in the right spot. That means... That you have gone, gone through an experience with God. You have an intimacy with God. You have a love with God that transcends just a bunch of rules and regulations. You are intimate with him. Just like those moms and dads that now you don't want to offend them. You love them. You don't want to bring harm and reproach to their name. You don't want to bring harm and reproach to the name of Jesus Christ. Because you love him. He has proven his love to you. And he has saved you through this experience. And so understand that that is true repentance. It is a heart that has set... I will not sin against God. Amen. It's not that I sin this morning and I ask God to forgive me and then I go tomorrow and I sin and I never have an intention to change my behavior. That's, That's not repentance. Repentance is that in sincerity I have decided this morning, this moment, this time that I will not do something that offends God. 
And God knows if I'm sincere. He knows if I'm trying as hard as I can from that moment forward. Now, I may go tomorrow and mess up. I may go a few days and mess up again. But God knows that in my heart, I'm trying to do the best I can to not sin against him. That's repentance. It's turning away from sinful behavior. It's not just saying, God, forgive me. That's part of it. Or, God, I'm sorry. That's part of it. It's saying, God, I have offended you. I have broken your laws, and I have been disobedient. Therefore, from this moment forward, I'm going to do my best with the power of the Holy Spirit. God, if you'll help me, then I'm going to do right by you. That's repentance. And so once you repent and you have a sincere mind, your heart's made up that I'm not going to do that anymore. God understands your sincerity, and the Bible says he'll forgive you. He will forgive you. There's nothing you have ever done that God will not forgive you from if you approach him in sincerity. If you approach him with a repentant heart. I'm not going to live that way anymore, Lord. You saved me from all that, and I messed up. And sometimes there's tears, and sometimes there's pain in that offering. And I'm going to tell you, for it to be a broken heart, it has to be tears and pain many times. When you've offended the Almighty God that's done so much for you, if you don't think he's done much for you, you read about the historical record of Roman crucifixion, the beatings, the batter, the way that he was beaten within inches of his life, forced to carry a wooden beam up Golgotha's hill, forced to lay down as they nailed him to a cross in his hands and through his feet. Read what happened when he was beaten with a cat nine tails. Read the historical record about the way that Roman people punished and they did it so that they could delay the torture. They could kill you quickly. They could behead you. They could do something so that you could die quickly. If you were, if that was their intention was just to kill you, there's easier ways to do it than crucifixion. They made an example out of Jesus. They tortured him. They were brutal to him. They showed everybody that looked up on that cross that if you're not careful, the same thing will happen to you. And they led by fear and intimidation. And they nailed our Savior who said, let love be your motive to a cross, a torture instrument, and he died for me and for you. So I remind myself often when I feel like it's getting too hard and living for God's just too tough, I just remember what he suffered on Calvary's cross. And I just pray to him and I ask him to forgive me for even having that thought because God, you died for me. Heaven forbid, I won't live for you. And once you become mature in your faith, you'll find that God will help you He'll help you along the way. And so the command to be baptized. The day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, we just read that together. What the Bible says is that the they were in the upper room, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says Jesus tells them as he departs from them, he says, you shall receive power once the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You shall be witnesses. He says, tarry in Jerusalem. Stay in Jerusalem until you're full of the Holy Ghost. And so they he goes back to heaven. And then they go into the upper room, the Bible says, and they start having a prayer meeting. They're praying that God will give them direction, that God will show them the next steps in their ministry. They know that God is doing something and they want to know what they can do to be helpful. So they're praying. They're seeking the face of God in the upper room. Well, the Bible says in Acts 2 and 4, it says that the Holy Ghost falls upon them, and it says that they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Now, this is something new. This is something that had not happened up to that point. This was showing in a very symbolic way that this is that which has been prophesied by the, uh, of the prophet Joel and that Jesus promised when he told us about the Holy Ghost before he left. And so the Bible says that he spent some time with them, perfecting their understanding of the new covenant. And it also says in Matthew chapter 16 that Peter was the leader of the church because he gave him the keys to the kingdom. And so Peter, being the leader of the church, is the one that stands as they spill out into the street, the 120 that were in that upper room, that are now speaking in all these languages that they had never learned. And on the day of Pentecost, Jewish people from all over the world came to Jerusalem and they experienced the feast of Pentecost together and they had been doing that for thousands of years. Well now on this specific day of Pentecost they see something very unusual something supernatural something miraculous happening and that is that those that were having a prayer meeting, an extended prayer meeting, a unified prayer meeting those that were in one mind and one accord do you hear where I'm going with this? Had been praying for God to fill them with the Holy Ghost, the Comforter which he said I'll send in my name. 
And so the Bible says that as they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they began to speak in other tongues. They spill out into the streets. And then they start saying, what's wrong with these people? Something's going on here. These people are drunk. And so the Bible says Peter stands up amongst the 11. I like to point that out because there's a lot of people that will say, well, Matthew says this in his book or John says this in his book. Or they'll try to put the disciples or the apostles, they'll try to pit them against each other. And so if they were all there standing as Peter gave the inaugural message, the first sermon ever preached on the day of Pentecost, don't you think there would have been a bit of conflict if they thought he got it wrong? There definitely was when Paul came to Jerusalem and challenged Peter to his face. When Peter was telling them that they had to fulfill the law of Moses, they had to be circumcised and they had to do all the things that they had always done as Jewish people. And then Paul comes and says, no, you are forcing them back into the law when Jesus Christ has given us grace from the law. The law was a schoolmaster. It told us how we were dirtbags. It showed us that we could not do anything. We were filthy rags. And Jesus has paid the price, the penalty for our sins. He has done everything for us. You cannot make those that call themselves by the name of Christ do those things that we have traditionally been told we have to do to fulfill the law of Moses. It doesn't work together. Jesus Christ said he came to fulfill the law. He came to express the law. The ceremony, the sacrifice, yes, all that was nailed to a cross. We don't sacrifice bulls and goats anymore because a perfect human being was finally sacrificed and laid down his life for us. And I can imagine Paul was passionate as he saw the Old Testament connection being a Pharisee of Pharisees with this Messiah, Jesus Christ, who had revealed himself to him on that Damascus road to say, how dare you put these conditions upon God's children when God himself fulfilled them on the cross? So that happened in your Bible. Read it. It's in the book of Acts. It says he challenges Peter because Peter's teaching them wrong. And it says that they meet together in Jerusalem and Pastor James, they pray and they seek the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says that the Holy Ghost reveals to them that they should not fulfill the law of Moses in ceremony and sacrifice. And you can read it for yourself. And so understand that if there would have been a challenge, we would have seen a challenge, I feel, if the God's going to preserve his word and protect his word, and he has, on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached it wrong. But the reason you don't see that is because Peter didn't preach it wrong. Right. When Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, they were all in agreement. They were all there. And they never challenged his teaching. Repent. Be water baptized, That's right. and you shall be full of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So let me be clear. The Bible commands that you be baptized with water in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what it teaches. Amen. And we're going to look through the book of Acts, and we're going to see where it teaches those things. And we're not going to read all the scripture. But what we are going to do is I'm going to tell you what chapters they're in. And for time's sake, if you want to write them down, by all means, go home and read them. Because I'm going to tell you that most churches teach this differently than we teach this. That's right. And I want you to understand that it comes from a contextual misrepresentation of the importance of the book of Acts and the apostles and what they taught. That's right. The reason why Pentecostal churches, specifically apostolic Pentecostals, call ourselves apostolic is because we teach what the apostles taught. We don't believe that Paul taught something later, that it started out as an immature revelation on the day of Pentecost, that Paul got a perfect revelation later, and you start reading about that perfect revelation in Romans and other books. That's what people teach. Right. Bible doesn't teach that, but that's what people teach. And they get hung up on the idea that if I'm asking you to do anything, then it's not a free gift of God, and I'm adding to the finished work of the cross. You've probably heard some of this. Right. They're saying, if Jesus paid it all, how dare you ask me to do something in order to obey the word? Right. And now, let me tell you this. It's kind of like I shared once before when I said, if I tell you as a friend that I want to give you $1,000 as a gift. <laughs> now, I have the $1,000, but I tell you, well, of course, most of you are like, oh, yes, I'd love that. Oh, yeah. That would help me out. Yeah. Praise God. Glory, hallelujah. I've been praying for a blessing. And he's going to bless me through you. 
I don't know many of you that wouldn't say, yes, I need it, <laughs> including me. And so understand that if I tell you, okay, well, I'm going to give you $1,000, it's a gift, but you're going to have to meet me at the bank in the morning, meet me there about 9.30 a.m., I'm going to write a check, give it to the teller, I'm going to endorse that check with my name. I can't write son. I can't write father. I can't write preacher. i got to sign it, Mark McLean, or it's not endorsed. I'm going to sign that check, and I'm going to give it to that teller. That teller is going to give me $1,000, and I'm going to give it to you. Now, remember, we all just said, hey, that's a free gift. I didn't work for that. Right. But I told you that you had to get in your car in the morning. You had to drive to that bank. I had to get in my vehicle. I had to go to that bank. I had to sign that check. I had to have that teller. There were some conditions that you had to meet. Right. Now, we, we don't think that's work, okay? Y'all all said, oh, no, man, I'll take that $1,000. I don't mind taking a short drive to the bank. The Bible says you have to meet the conditions in order to accept and receive the free gift of God's salvation. It's not work. It is the conditions that we must do in order to receive the greatest gift we could receive. And that's what we have to understand, Amen. is that it's not a work. And what I say to preachers, specifically Baptists and others, and I'm not beating up on anybody. I was preaching a men's devotional at the Baptist church last Saturday. God moved in that place, and I'm just praying I can preach at all these Baptist churches. I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm preaching at Crestview Middle School. I'm preaching on Holly Grove Road. I just want to tell the story of Jesus, because I'm going to tell you something, that we teach in the public school about Jesus Christ. My final lesson of every year in sixth grade is Jesus Christ and his teachings. Because if you look at Jesus Christ and his teachings about love and compassion, about lifting up individuals, individual worth and individual value, that is part of what destroyed the Roman Empire. Right. For hundreds of years, people were convinced that this God loves me so much, you can't threaten me anymore, Rome. You can take my life. You can feed me to the lions of the Colosseum. You can burn me to the stake. You can nail me to the cross, but I'm going to live according to the teachings of the Word of God. They fought in, and they were sincere, and they became convicted, and it eventually destroyed and destabilized the Roman Empire. Today, there's 2.2 billion Christians in the world. Now, most of them are not real Christians. They call themselves Christians. They don't obey the Bible, but if you look at the numbers, it is still the largest world religion, if you want to use that language. But just understand that the Bible makes it plain that there are certain things that we must do. But when my friends come to me and they say, well, you're requiring me to work, I say, okay. Well, what do I have to do to be saved? And they'll say, well, they'll take me to Romans chapter 10. The Roman road, they'll call it. And they'll say that Paul says in Romans chapter 10 that you have to, uh, you know, whatever you believe and whatever you say. Right? So the ABCs, except... Believe and confess. That's what they'll tell us. Now, I want you to understand that every Christian church believes that you have to repent. They believe that you have to be water baptized. And they also believe that you will be filled with the Holy Ghost. They just think all that stuff looks different and that the last two is not necessary. Okay? So they all believe that you'll have those three experiences in one way or the other. But they'll say that water baptism and receiving the Holy Ghost in an expressive or a supernatural way is not a part of God's plan for today. So they'll say once you accept Christ and you've heard it, you accept it, and you believe it with your mind, and you confess it, you say a sinner's prayer, y'all have heard this, you know where I'm going, once you confess it, then the Holy Spirit regenerates you at that time. You don't feel anything, there's no experience, there's no expression. The book of Acts is filled with people who could tell you the day and the hour when God filled them with the Holy Ghost and you got a church world today that says you don't have to do nothing but show up and pay your tithes. And that's what they do. And the Bible doesn't teach that. And so understand that it's going to cost you something. It's just like Dave, David said, how dare me? Is there not a cause? How dare me buy a threshing floor? Or you give it to me for free. I will not dedicate something to God that costs me nothing. Or Abraham, when he bought the cave of Machpelah, he said, I will buy it and purchase it at regular price because I will not dedicate something in honor of God that costs me nothing. The world says you should be able to do whatever you want to do. You shouldn't be given any restrictions or any obligations. We don't want you to have to make a commitment. We just want you to show up and have good church. The Bible says it's going to cost you something. And it says it in Old Testament and New. But it says, guess what? Heaven's going to be worth it all. One 
one day your faith is going to come to an end. You know when it's going to come to an end? Because you're going to see your Savior face to face. Eye to eye. You're going to see the nail prints in his hand. And he's going to say, I got these in the house of my friends. And it's all going to make sense. And those that laughed at you, those that mocked you, those that belittled you, they are going to bow their knee. And they are going to confess that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Just keep going. Hang on and live for Jesus. And one day, Someday soon, you are going to see the just fruits of your labor and your reward as you cast your crowns before the feet of the almighty king of glory. Yes, That's what the Bible says. Hang on. It's sometimes your faith in the devil. First thing he did in the garden was introduce doubt. He's going to make you doubt everything you've ever been taught. Just hang on. Yes, sir. Realize what God is doing and hang on to the power of God. So we call what we're doing here today apologetics. And apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia. And it doesn't mean to apologize. We're not apologizing for our faith. It means to answer or defend something. So what you're doing is you are answering those that challenge you and you are defending your faith. And so when those people come to me and say, okay, well, you have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I say, wait a minute, isn't that a condition? Why don't he just save me without me accepting him? Yeah, right. Well, you have to believe. Okay, what does that mean? Does that mean I just make up in my mind that God is Jesus and that Jesus is God? Does that mean, tell me what it means to believe. And then finally confess, you mean I have to say something? Now remember, their argument is you're making these people work. You're putting conditions on these people. You Pentecostals are saying you have to be baptized. You Pentecostals are saying you have to be full of the Holy Ghost. And I'm saying, well, you are saying that I have to accept. You are saying that I have to believe. And you are saying that I have to confess. What's the difference? So we either believe that we can get out here and live like dirtbags and take no thought and knowledge of God, don't attend church. Why? If God's going to say who he wants and everybody that he doesn't save is going to be lost, then I would go out here and I would have the time of my life for my 80 or 90 years. Why? I had no choice in the matter. If God loves me so much, he's going to save me no matter what. I'm going to go out and live like a hellion. You want two or three girlfriends? Go for it. You want to rob, steal, cheat? Go for it. You can get away with it. By all means, God's going to save you. His grace will cover a multitude of sins. There are churches today that they are not doing it the way I'm doing it, but that's what they're saying in an indirect way. You can come in here and you can sit on here and we'll have a good time. You can walk out that door and you can do whatever you want and God loves you. You're his child and he'll save you. He's not going to send you to hell. There are people that tell you that every day on every corner and that's an attractive message. When you got a young man or an old man standing over a pulpit or a young lady or an old lady, whomever's teaching you that you have to do something. You have to live a holy life. You have to straighten up. You have to look like Christ. That's hard. If you want easy, you can go to any other church in this community. And you can find easy. But what I'm telling you is the Bible teaches that it's going to cost you something. And so when they hem haul around and they say, well, wait a minute now. You mean to tell me that you think me requiring you to say a prayer is work? Well, of course I do. And I said, because as a matter of fact, the Bible word believe, you know, it means action. And I've shared this story before too, but I want to share it again. It's like those people that used to, they'd walk over Niagara Falls. I believe it was in the 50s or the 60s, but this is some folks would do for entertainment. They'd come and watch these tightrope walkers, and they'd walk across a tightrope across the Niagara Falls, and they're thinking, oh my goodness, he's going to fall, he's going to die, you know, but he had been perfecting his craft. You know, think about the circus, when you'd have that person get up there, and they'd walk across that line, and you'd think, oh goodness, if they just fall one way or the other, then they're going to die. These tightrope walkers would walk across Niagara Falls. And so the story is told that one day the man came and he had a wheelbarrow. And he said, how many of you folks believe I can walk across that tightrope? Yeah. They said, oh, yeah, you can do it. We believe you. He said, all right, get in this wheelbarrow. Oh, no, wait a minute now. No, no you can do it. We know you can do it. No, see, it, it was much different when their lives were in his hands. And that's the difference. All day long, we'll talk about Jesus and his work. We'll praise him and all the sacrifices and the hardship that he went through. We'll watch him walk the tightrope. But when he tells us to get in the barrel, oh, no. Wait a minute. We know you can do it. We don't know if we can do all that. We don't want to put our lives, listen to me, in your hands. 
That's what believe is. Believe in the Bible is an action word. It means I believe something to my very death. If it costs me my life to stand for Jesus, I believe and I will accept my faith because I know that God planned it and sent it before it came. That's what the Bible says. Meanwhile, you got churches and preachers all over Christianity that will tell you just do whatever you want to. Come on down. We got a good music program. We got a good children's program. We have potlucks. We have activities. We got yoga on Mondays. We got cooking club on Tuesdays. We got all kinds of social activities to keep you busy. And 80% of Christians fall for that because they never ever read their Bibles. You're telling it right. And that's the truth. And these preachers, they're not deceivers. They're not intentionally, most of them, there are some I'm sure that are, but they're not intentionally trying to lead people astray, but they have justified bad decisions. Well, the Bible can't say that because my grandma didn't believe that way. Well, the Bible can't say that. Uh, I, I see what it says, but I just don't believe baptism necessary. My, my uncle Zeke wasn't baptized. You know, I, he's the greatest man I ever know. He's a good man. He's got to be in heaven. You're telling me he's in hell? Wait a minute. Those are the kinds of arguments you'll start hearing. And I'm talking about from preachers. Yes, yes. I'm not talking about from the laity or the saint. They'll say, are you telling me that because so-and-so or such-and-such -such didn't go through the Acts 2.38 experience that they're lost? And I said, no, I'm not. Because the Bible doesn't give you as a human being the authority to cast people into hell. That's why. Right, right. I'm going to tell you how it is to be saved. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. And I'm going to say that God is a just and a merciful God. Right. And God knows your last final moments. He knows your heart. He knows what you've experienced and what you haven't. I will never stand up on this platform and say that sister such and such is in heaven today or brother such and such is in hell today because that is not my job. Right. My job is to preach the gospel. And it is your responsibility to get in your private prayer place and receive it. Accept it, believe it, and allow God to transform your life. You have a church world filled with people that know that it's something more than shaking the preacher's hand. And every church they go to fails them and says, you don't have to do nothing but sign the card and show up. And they know in their heart there's got to be more to God than this. Yes. You're right, man. Yes. And you've got the message. You've got the Holy Ghost. Let him out. All right. Sister Vesta Mangan used to say, let him out. Yeah. So when God tells you to pray for somebody, you know the devil didn't tell you to pray for her. Uh -huh. You know the devil didn't tell you to encourage that person. You're right. You know the devil didn't tell you to put your arm around that sister that you saw at Walmart. You're right. if, you, if it's laid on your heart and it's positive, don't you say that I don't have enough confidence. Do what God told you to do. Right. Lay your arms around them. Shake their hand. Hug their neck. Love on them because the world's beating them down. And if you're having those thoughts, you know the devil didn't put them there. Do what God's called you to do. Churches are filled with people. I'm talking about apostolic Pentecostal churches are filled with people that was one time a friend to somebody else. They knew somebody that knew somebody and God got a hold of somebody that got a hold of somebody and they just had to have a little bit of what somebody got. They showed up, they got sincere, they got mature and God got a hold of them and now every time the doors are open, their car's in the parking lot and they're walking through that back door. They don't have a lot, they don't look a lot. They're not the big positions in town, they're not the respectable politicians. They're the ones that God a miracle in their life and if we gave them the microphone they could preach this message better than me because they've seen it they've experienced it and they have revealed it God has revealed it to them through prayer and sincerity right. Amen. church needs what you have yes. and don't be shy don't be bashful don't be timid let it out let them see that there's a God and God loves them <laughs> first Peter 3 and 15 brother Joseph if you'll put it on the board for me I don't have a scripture text typed out I normally do and that bothers me, but I just ran out of time. It says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Always be ready. Know your Bible and stand on your Bible. Tell them this is why we believe what we believe. Because the Bible teaches it. They don't care what you think. They don't care what I think. 
I heard a preacher say one time that men will not cross the road to hear what you have to say, but they'll come from thousands of miles to hear what God has to say. Let God do what God is doing in your life. Every one of you right now are thinking about something that may have happened recently where you had an opportunity to be a Christian in front of them, where you had the opportunity to love on them, to show them mercy, to show them grace. Maybe it was somebody that didn't deserve it. Maybe it's somebody you finally had the courage to forgive. Just understand that when you do those things, you are changing the word, the world for the name of Jesus Christ. You're showing people what it means to be righteous, what it means to be loving, and what it means to be compassionate. Always be ready to give an answer or defend your faith. Baptism is compared to circumcision. We're not going to read all this, but circumcision in the Old Testament says it was a covenant, it was a sign, and it was required. That's in Genesis 17 and 14. It said that if a man was not circumcised, he was cut off from the kingdom of God. Now, the Old Testament taught faith, and it said faith, and we hear faith all the time. The Old Testament means trust or faith, and it does teach trust and faith just like the New Testament does. But understand that they were required to do something. Noah had to build that ark, or he'd have been lost. Abraham had to leave his father's house, or he'd have been worshiping pagans just like his father Terah. They were required to do something for their newfound faith, their trust in God. It sparked them to action. It provoked them to live for God, to do his work. So it's saying if you are not circumcised, you are cut off. Now circumcision is a symbol. It's a symbol of your faith. And it's not, it's a type in the Old Testament because females couldn't be circumcised. In the Old Testament, they were covered by their father. They were covered by their husband. Understand that the New Testament's a little bit different. Every man has to be, every woman has to come to the knowledge of the salvation of Jesus Christ, has to accept him, and has to go through the Acts 238 experience. In the Old Testament, it was a bit different. If you want to talk about that, that's going to be a long Bible study, but we'll do it. It is my heart, not that you believe me when I say, but that you get a heart and a love for the Scripture so that you will go yourself and you will read it for yourself and you will encourage yourself and you will realize that Brother Creasy's been teaching me for 30 years and he's been teaching me right. Sister Creasy's been teaching me for 30 years. She's been teaching me right. Brother Mark's been teaching me for 10 years and he's been teaching me right. I'm not trying to brag on us. I'm trying to brag on God. And just say, if you'll get into the Scripture, if you'll search it out for yourself, if you'll pray for the Holy Spirit's guidance, you're going to see the power of God in a way that you never thought possible. He still intervenes in the affairs of man. If you need healing like that woman with an issue of blood, you just grab a hold of him and watch what he'll do to you. He'll do a miracle in your life, even if it's off the time, if it's out of time, even if it's something that wasn't a part of his original plan. Just like that woman that went to that unjust judge and she tormented him day and night. She begged him for a certain relief. And finally he says, this woman terrifies me. She tortures me. Every day she worries me. By all means, do what this woman wants done. Give it to her. And Jesus taught that parable to say that just because God don't give it to you the first time, keep going. Keep praying. Keep seeking. God knows why he waits. We don't understand, but we know God. And because we love him and trust him, we believe that it's a part of his plan. It don't feel good. It hurts sometimes. But God loves me, and I love God, and he does not work for me. I work for him. And if it costs me 10 years of suffering and misery to save a soul, God's going to cost me 10 years of suffering and misery because your soul is far more important than this natural body, this natural flesh that we cater to every day. And so I don't know why it's happening, Lord. I don't know why I lost my job. I don't know why they ran out on me. I don't know why they don't behave. God knows. And because of that, here's the way I pray. God, I don't have faith in me. God, I don't have faith in them. But God, I have faith in you. And because I trust you and I'm doing what I can to the best of my knowledge to follow and obey this word that you've given me, I believe with all I am that it may take a decade. It may take 20 years. I may never see the results of the fruit of this labor, but I'm going to pray anyway. I'm going to live for you anyway. I'm going to do what you want And sometimes you have to pray that way. Oh, yes. Sometimes it don't look good. Right. Everything you're doing, it ain't working. Right. Everything they're doing, it's not working. And only God knows. Pray anyway. Amen. Seek God anyway. You're going to receive a miracle. Baptism compared to the water of Noah's day that saved Noah but destroyed everyone else. First Peter, Brother Joseph, 
3, 20 through 21. I want to read this in your hearing. Yeah, I want to verse, uh, 1 Peter 3 and 20 says, Which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was prepared, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now look at that. So those that believed went into the ark. They were saved by the same water that murdered everybody else. And so baptism, read it. Number 21, brother, go on down. It says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth now all save us. Okay, let's, let's stop right there. It says not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it compares in verse 20. It shows you that those that had entered the ark were saved by the water, and those that did not enter the ark were destroyed by the water. The like figure in the New Testament is that you go into the watery grave of baptism, you put on Christ, you take on the name of Christ. I mean, there's a hundred scriptures I could give you for this, but just understand that that water that saves you will be water that will destroy those who do not enter that ark of testimony that don't go through baptism. Now, Brother Mark, are you teaching baptismal regeneration? Are you teaching that the water saves? I am not. The Bible says your faith, a made-up mind. You go in that watery grave of baptism and you do it because God obeyed you to do or God commanded you to do it. It's not the water that saves you. It's a heart that is changed. It's a transformed life that's gone through repentance. A dead man is put into a grave and then rises and resurrects to that new man. You become a new thing. You become a new creature in Christ. According to the apostles, you come up out of that water and you feel freedom that you've never felt before. You feel like all those thousands of things that you had thrown on your own shoulders and all the consequences of your sins, it feels like you just just let them go and you feel freedom that you never felt before because God commanded you to. It's not the water that saves you. It's your faith in Jesus Christ that saves you. And you obey his word when you obey Acts 2.38 when it comes to entering the New Testament covenant. Another thing I'm told, I'm told is what about that thief on the cross? And every time when I'm talking about salvation and I talk about baptism, I say, well, what about that thief? Let me tell you about that thief. That thief died under the old covenant. Now, I've heard preachers say before that, you know, remember the, the command to be baptized didn't come to the day of Pentecost. Preachers, Peter's preaching, and he says, repent and be baptized. He tells us then to be water baptized. That had not yet happened. So that thief dies under the old covenant. Now, I've heard preachers say, well, you know, uh, th that thief, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, you know, they, they died first, and, and Jesus' death brought in the new covenant. Well, what does the Bible say? You've got to be careful, preachers, because the Bible says in John 19, 32 through 33, that Jesus died first. That's right. That's right. So you've got to be careful. I've heard preachers say, well, no, 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 no. They died under the old covenant, and then when Jesus died, the new covenant came in. Wait a minute. John 19 says he died first. Because it says that they broke the legs of the thieves and they came to him. He was already dead, so they stabbed him with a spear, which right. promoted prophecy. It had been prophesied. And so you've got to understand that the command to be water baptized did not come until the day of Pentecost. Peter preaching. And so don't get hung up on that. Jesus himself was baptized for our example. Luke 3, 21 through 22, and the other gospels mentioned his baptism. They talk about the Roman road in Romans 10 and 17. We've already mentioned. But do you know that Romans also tells us that it was written to the church in Rome? And Romans 6, 17, if you would put that up for me, brother. Many times we'll say, well, we get our doctrine from the book of Acts. If you want to know how to become a part of the church that you have to find your doctrine in the book of Acts. Well, a lot of churches will say, oh no, it's the Roman road or Romans chapter 10. And so remember that that letter was written to a church and in order to become a part of the church you had gone through the Acts 2.38 experience already. And God even tells us in Romans 6.17 but God be thanked that you the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine that was delivered unto you. These are people in an established church that had already gone through the New Testament salvation experience Experience. There is no conflict in Scripture when it comes to Romans chapter 9 or Romans chapter 10. Right. Acts is where you find your teaching for how to be a part of the church. I'm going to close with this. Baptism in Acts on the verse chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost. 
where the Bible says that over 3,000 souls were added to the same experience, the same experience that those had in the upper room. And so Acts chapter 2, we see being full of the Holy Ghost and water baptism introduced for the first time. In Acts chapter 8, we read about Samaria. Philip is down there preaching. They repented. They've been baptized. But then John and Peter come down, lay hands on them, and they receive the Holy Ghost, which seems, at least in Acts chapter 8, to be a very distinct experience than that just of just uh, saying some prayer and you don't experience anything. It was a supernatural expression of God's love. Acts chapter 9, we read about Paul, where Paul is knocked off of that beast on the road to Damascus, ready with letters in hand to persecute the church. We read about Ananias, who is fearful, but he goes and finds this Paul, and he takes Saul and he buries him in the watery grave of baptism. Paul mentions the experience in Acts chapter 22. He tells his testimony in Acts chapter 22. Read it for yourself, but Acts chapter 9 says that Paul was water baptized. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius in his house was water baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer was baptized when he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And in Acts chapter 19, the disciples of John the Baptist, they are told, Paul shows up and says, if you receive the Holy Ghost, since you believe, the pastor told on this not long ago. And they said, we don't even know if there be any Holy Ghost. And he says, well, what baptism were you baptized? They said, John's baptism. And he took them and baptized them in the name of Jesus Christ. And then he laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost and spoke in other tongues. Acts chapter 19 mentions that. So Acts 2, 8, 9, 10, 16, and 19, you have at least six proof texts in the book of Acts to show you that in order to become a part of God's church, you have to repent of your sins, be water baptized in Jesus' name, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Praise the Lord. Matthew 28, I'm going to end with this final selection of scripture. 28 and 18, it says, if you would please stand with me, I'd like to pray for you and I want to read this in your hearing. The churches today, the preachers, they talk about the Great Commission. It's our job to go out and preach the gospel. This is the Great Commission. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Jesus. The subject is Jesus. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name. The name. Now verse 18 tells us, Jesus, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. And then he tells us, go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. I had a man ask me one time, well, why did Jesus say, go and be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Ghost? And he was trying to throw me off because Mark chapter 16 tells us to go get baptized in Jesus' name, Acts is filled with Jesus' name, baptism. Every time the apostles baptize, they baptize in the name of Jesus. That's what the Bible says. But you know why I believe Jesus spoke that? You remember that Old Testament provision that says by the mouth of two or three witnesses let every word be established. Every new doctrine. Jesus was saying I'm Jesus and I have all power on heaven and earth. And just to validate my claim baptize in the name Jesus of the Father. In the name Jesus of the Son. And in the name Jesus of the Holy Ghost. So if you don't take my testimony alone Hear it from two or three witnesses. I believe that's what God's doing there in that verse. Because the apostles, at least, in the book of Acts, translated it to mean Jesus' name. There was no confusion for them. Every time they baptized, in the name of Jesus. I'd like to pray for you. Bow your heads. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for these wonderful people that are gathered here in your name. We taught this morning on water baptism, repentance last week. Next week will be Holy Ghost experience, baptism. God, there are people in here today searching their hearts. Is this real? God, I pray you'll show them it's real. And I pray they'll develop a passion, a burning passion, to search the scriptures for themselves, to read it for themselves, to pray and have it revealed to them. Because when you give them a revelation, no man will take it from them. And I pray, God, you'll do just that. In Jesus' name, amen.
God bless you. Give the Lord a hand clap. We love you. Thank you.